There are thousands, many thousands of books about Lincoln, as, as everybody knows, and I have touched on Lincoln in a number of my books on the pre-Civil War period, the Reconstruction era after the war, but I personally have never really written directly about Lincoln, and I feel that despite the large literature, much of which is very good, focusing in on Lincoln and slavery, as this book does, Lincoln's relationship to slavery, his attitude towards slavery, how that changed, as it did enormously over the course of his life, I th thought that it was still possible to say something new about that, um, despite the voluminous literature that's out there. I feel that Lincoln is so relevant to our society today, not that you can pick him up and say, well, what would Lincoln think about abortion rights, or what would Lincoln think about a stimulus package? No, that's not the issue. Lincoln's life illuminates persistent questions of American history, obviously the question of race, the question of the role of the government, the question of the role of presidential leadership, uh, the question of social mobility and in our society as he experienced in his own life. Uh, you know, there's so many aspects. He seems like the quintessential American in some ways, and that's why I think every generation takes a new look at Lincoln. So there's nothing unusual, perhaps, in me coming along and saying, well, there's 10,000 books on Lincoln, but I have something to say, ten, book number 10,001, I don't claim that this is the final word on Lincoln, but I do think that Lincoln is always, in some ways, our contemporary. Well, we know that Lincoln grew up in very modest circumstances, on a self-sufficient farm. His father, you know, held the family together, but was not accumulating any significant amount of money. But he experienced in his own lifetime what we call the market revolution, and he benefited from it. Illinois, where he grew and lived most of his life before the war, um, went through the market revolution. By the, by, uh, Lincoln, as a youth, takes goods to uh, New Orleans on a flatboat. By the time he's becoming president, there are railroads crisscrossing Illinois. He's a lawyer for some of these railroads. And the state is becoming one of the major economic centers of the United States. Lincoln believes that this tremendous economic expansion um, offers opportunities to people like himself. It's the promise of free labor. And that heightens, the rise of free labor heightens the contrast between North and South, between free labor and slave labor. And uh, Lincoln really is part of the glorification of Northern society as a place of opportunity, as opposed to what he considers the stagnant and unfair and undemocratic structure of slave society. We don't know exactly what Lincoln read. I mean, we know what books he owned, but what he read, how it influenced him is not 100% clear. But there's no question that Lincoln was quite familiar with the global or the Atlantic anti-slavery world. He, in one uh, speech, he talks about Wilberforce and Sharp, the people who led the abolition of the movement to abolish slavery, the slave trade in England. And his early plans for getting rid of slavery are very much influenced by what happened in the British West Indies. Gradual emancipation with compensation, monetary compensation to the slave owners, and some kind of apprenticeship system, uh, some kind of transition from slavery to freedom. That's what happened in the 1830s in the British West Indies, and that's what Lincoln proposes in the early years of the Civil War as a way of getting the process of emancipation going, particularly in those border slave states that remain in the Union. So Lincoln was quite aware, he was a edu self-educated man, but widely read. He was quite aware of the widespread uh, uh, discussions and actions about slavery in the 19th century world. The problem with studying Lincoln is we know how it ended. You know, we know the story. Of course, historians always know the story, but it's impossible to free yourself completely from the image of the great emancipator. And it's very easy to follow from that. Well, this was a guy who was planning to be the emancipator his whole life. He just was waiting for public opinion. You, in some of these books, you get a picture of a Lincoln who never changes. He's born with a pen in his hand, ready to emancipate the slaves, and waits for the right moment. This is totally unhistorical. Uh, there was, the problem with that is it, it doesn't see the trajectory of his history, which is full of detours and maybe false paths, he ends up as, a, as the great emancipator, no question about it. But he doesn't just get there in a straight line. So that if you take this more traditional view, it's very hard to explain why for much of his life he believes that slaves should be freed but colonized outside the United States. 
They should go to Haiti. They should go to Central America. He can't really conceptualize the United States as a biracial society of free people until really the last two years of his life. But at that time, he does really rethink these questions and moves to a very different position, which I think is much more interesting than to just say, well, he's born with all the right views and that's it throughout his whole life. The relation of abolitionists in the war to Lincoln is very complicated. Some of them, like Wendell Phillips, Douglas, Frederick Douglass, criticized him very severely at times. They thought he was too slow to act against slavery. On the other hand, they praised him enormously for steps that he did take. And um, I think they realized that, again, as Owen Lovejoy, a radical in Congress, said, the radical steed, the radical horse, is pulling the carriage. It may, not be, it may not be going as fast as we want, but it's going in the right direction. You know, six months into the Civil War, in the fall of, two, uh, of, of uh, 1861, Lincoln comes forth with a plan for abolition in Delaware. Now, the, the war has barely begun. There's been hardly any battles, and yet he, he puts, gets the ball rolling on emancipation in the border. So this was his initiative. Nobody was pushing him at that point to deal with Delaware. So I think people recognize this is a deeply anti-slavery person, and yet Lincoln felt constrained by the Constitution, by the political situation, by the war situation, and it was only when all those things came together and made emancipation seem like the wisest policy that he then, you know, strikes while the iron is hot, so to speak. People have drawn a parallel between Lincoln and Obama. Of course, when Obama was running for president, he kind of channeled Lincoln a little himself, both from Illinois, of course, and other things. Um, both of them came under severe criticism from what you might call the political left. Uh, and some of, they resented it to some extent, although I would have to say that um, Lincoln at least showed a kind of open-mindedness and willingness to listen to people. Abolitionists went to the White House. Lincoln talked to them. He knew what they were saying. His press secretary or his secretary, Hayes, condemned them as Jacobins. But Lincoln knew that he and the abolitionists were, in a sense, in the same ballpark, even though he was not one of them. Uh, once in referring to radicals in Missouri, he said they may be devils, but they're devils facing Zion word. They're going in the right direction. They're going too fast for me, but they're, we're, on the sa uh, you know, we're in the same boat in a sense. Um, I actually think one of Lincoln's most remarkable characteristics was this open-mindedness, willingness to listen to criticism, willingness to take criticism seriously. He didn't just invite yes men into the White House. He didn't say, I only want to speak to people who agree with me. He didn't surround himself with just a small range of opinions. Um, you know, whether one wants to compare him to Obama on this front, uh, that's a different issue. But I think Lincoln's open-mindedness and recognition that in a monumental crisis, you must be open to new ideas, I think that's what enables him to change and grow during the Civil War. Of course, historians uh, don't like to make to pose parallels too closely between periods of the past and the present, although we all do it and others do it, um, certainly appeals to prejudice, appeals to racism, appeals to ethnocentrism, appeals to anti-immigrant sentiment uh, are very visible in our society today and certainly are not new. Lincoln in the 1850s had to deal with the know-nothings, a nativist anti-immigrant movement which he never joined and condemned, but on the other hand, he knew that Republicans needed their votes. So he kind of worked with them behind the scenes in some ways as well. Certainly, the Democratic Party in the Civil War era was deeply racist and used what today would seem completely outrageous racial epithets and racial language to attack the Republicans, to attack Lincoln. Um, and. You know, this can uh, yield political dividends at various times. You know, unfortunately, appeals to deep prejudice can sometimes win you votes. And Lincoln and Republicans, and this, this was one of the major obstacles to the anti-slavery movement, the deep-seated racism which was present in the North as well as in the South. Lincoln and all anti-slavery politicians had to try to deal with this. A former graduate student here at Columbia, now a professor, Manisha Sinha, wrote an op-ed piece comparing Lincoln's effort to uh, conciliate the border slave states and Obama's effort to conciliate Republicans. And she said, well, Lincoln eventually realized there was you, bipartisanship is a two-way street. You can't be bipartisan if the other side is not interested. And Lincoln eventually realized the border states were not interested in any plan of emancipation. 
He put forward various plans. They systematically reject them altogether. And eventually he moved to a completely different plan, which is immediate abolition. Um, so I, again, I'm wary of making historical parallels, pushing them too far. It's a diff we're 150 years later. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, Lincoln was, uh, the key about Lincoln, as I've said, is when one policy doesn't work, he's willing to change. He's not stubborn. He's not stuck to a policy. It's not a humiliation to admit, you know, this didn't work. We have to try something else. And that, I think, is one of the hallmarks of his greatness as a leader. By 1863, many, many people in the North who had not in any way considered themselves anti-slavery before the war are now saying the abolition of slavery is part of this war. This is the way to win the war, but it's also the way to create a better nation coming out of the war. And, you know, what is all this sacrifice going to add up to? What is going to justify it? A new, more perfect nation. So Lincoln is a brilliant writer. He has a command of the English language, second maybe only to Jefferson among our presidents. But um, it's not like he invents these ideas. He has this knack of formulating, in a brilliant way, general opinion. He has his finger on the pulse of northern public opinion. And he, he, he communicates with ordinary northerners in a very direct and effective way because he somehow has this, uh, you know, his, his political antennas and he knows what's happening in the general you know, trend of public opinion. I'm always asked what would have happened if Lincoln had not been killed. Of course, we don't know, but I think it's a fair question. I think what would have happened is what happened during the war. Lincoln and Congress would have debated and would have fought, and they would have reached an agreement. They would have, they would have reached some kind of general policy on Reconstruction. It probably would have looked like what Congress passed over Johnson's vetoes in 1866, civil rights for black people, maybe limited black suffrage, federal protection of the rights of the former slaves. It wouldn't have been the, as radical as Reconstruction will later become. Would it have worked better? Uh, who knows? This is total speculation.